I'm Cinder Niemela, and along with Charlotte Gilmano, welcome to the Inspired Wisdom Podcast. I believe the most powerful gifts you can give yourself is time to reflect on your talents and experience, and then have the wisdom to act with confidence and grace. This podcast is for entrepreneurs, leaders, and individuals who want to thrive in work and life. Your journey to being connected and inspired by the world around you starts right now. Welcome back to part two of my interview with John King. John is the co-author of the New York Times best-selling book titled Tribal Leadership. This book changed how we think about organizational culture. In episode 17, John shared with us his experiences as a professional dancer for 13 years, as a director and author in Hollywood of television shows and movies, leading programs and training coaches for Landmark Education, and meeting Dave Logan at Landmark, which led to a productive 13 years in business together. John co-wrote two books with Dave, The Coaching Revolution and Tribal Leadership, and he taught at USC Marshall School of Business, the School of Public Policy, and Annenberg School of Communication. If you haven't listened to part one, you won't want to miss John telling about his current work, training and coaching global leaders in Bulgaria, Turkey, Qatar, Yemen, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Southeast Asia, and Russia, just to name a few. Now in part two, John goes into more detail about how he came to write Tribal Leadership and his work with Zappos. John's full bio is on the inspiredwisdom.us website. If you enjoy my interview with John King, please subscribe to the Inspired Wisdom podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbeam, or wherever you go to download podcasts. Now let's join part two of my interview with John King. You know, I want to go back for a minute and talk about tribal leadership. Sure. How is it that you came about writing that book? And can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you did at Zappos? Oh, sure. I was, uh, I was a consultant at C.B. Richard Ellis, and I was working with high performing teams, teams that were doing working with high net worth people and, uh, and doing big commercial transactions. And uh, I was assigned to work with two young, eager guys who were trying to get a leg up. And so I was coaching them and they didn't get anything I was saying. And there was nothing about them that was wrong. In working with them, I found out that they had studied in college. And I went, wow, my dad was a geologist. I've got archaeology to the bone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we started talking about archaeology. And when I began to explain to them that uh, it really went from the standpoint of hunter-gatherer to kind of the agrarian to the industrial to, you know, I started working out this sort of deal. They began to see because I began to characterize the people who were doing well as the people who were in the agrarian and what they were in was the hunter gatherer phase. And what they needed to do was go farm for somebody else for a while, bring them a deal and farm for some. Well, it turned out to be that it worked. But the more I looked at it, the more I saw that this is just nothing but tribes here. And the tribes are directly functional to the degree that their language is empowering them. I didn't know what to ask or do or anything else like that. So I just started taking data and I did it for a long time, for about 10 years. Hmm. But when I sliced and diced the data, I found out that in terms of their language, they talk in five meta kind of means. And I thought, well, level one, two, three, four, and five. And mm -hmm. then I thought, no, I can't say that because uh, Jim Collins has already done level five leadership. So I changed it to stages mm -hmm. and I introduced it. The only tool that I had for about four or five years was the language thing. Life sucks. My life sucks. I'm great. You're not. We're great. They're not. And life is great. And that's the only thing that I kind of had to listen to and work with and stuff like that. But I was able to elevate the conversation and sort of explore the workings of this. And it was tribal, so I called it tribal leadership. Then I had a friend who was going through a career change. He had been a forum leader. The agreement when you leave that is you can't use any of the technology or distinctions of it. So 
he came to me, he was a good friend, and I said, well, let me teach you everything that I know. And so I was teaching him my little tribal leadership thing, and the phone rang, and I got a call from somebody who told me that the son of one of my clients, 15-year-old son, had committed suicide. Mm. And it was such a shock to me. I mean, this was a golden boy. Uh, he was being scouted by Notre Dame University. He was going to be the next Joe Montana. All of that stuff was going on, and he killed himself. And I couldn't get to it, so I went to the whiteboard, and I started drawing every relationship that I knew. I knew the kid, and I started drawing out every relationship that he had. And what I discovered was every relationship was a triangle. That was what stabilized him, was he had these triangular-type relationships that every one of them had disappeared in the last five months and nobody had noticed it because mm -hmm. his grandfather on his mother's side had died. His mother completely was, you know, grief stricken. And so she went to church and she took his sister with her and she went to church every day. The father was so freaked out about how his wife was going to be that he kind of like bailed and went over and took care of him. So even though they met for dinner every night, and it looked like a family, he was all alone. And the whole thing was around uh, the death of the grandfather and the inconsolable space that his mother was in. Well, that was fine. He was doing fine. But then the people who were scouting him told him that uh, he needed to go to a bigger school with a higher level of athletic competition and a higher scholastic level. So he transferred schools. Now he doesn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. So at school, prior to that, he had his best friend that he'd grown up with from when they were children. Their families are family friends that have been friends for 25 years by that time and were in business together. So he had his buddy, and then he had his girlfriend, Teresa. And so that was his little thing. He's 15 years old. My parents are doing what they're doing. Life is kind of wacky and crazy, but I've got Teresa and I got Mikey. He goes to the new school. And within a short period of time, Mikey and Teresa decide that they're actually in love with each other. Mm. And he has been betrayed. Mm. In his world, he's been betrayed. So he ditches school, steals the car from his family, goes and gets a couple of buddies, goes over to Mikey's house and beats up Mikey for stealing his girlfriend. So then everything hits the fan. And he is bad and wrong and bad and wrong and bad and wrong. And he is forced to apologize to Mikey with both families completely there. And he's forced to shake Mikey's hand. And Mikey's 15 years old. He won. So he smirks at him. And the kid goes home. And now he's handled that part. But he's in deep trouble because he stole the car and he lied to his parents and he lied to his coach and everything else like that. So he's in deep trouble and he's not going to get out of that for a long time. And two days later, he blew his brains out in his parents' bedroom closet. Oh, dear. And nobody understood yeah. it. And then when I drew it all out, I went, wow, it's all these broken triads. Mm -hmm. So that's when I began to realize, well, that's actually the basis of a network. If you take mm -hmm. a look at a geodesic dome, it's all triangle. All of our stable relationships are triangle. Well, wait a minute. We think that all of our relationships are dyadic. But the truth is, they're unstable as dyads. Where did we come up with this notion that the real law of relationship was two? And it turned out nobody knew, because I started asking that question in classes and nobody knew. And it turned out that where we learned that it was about two was from popular music and poetry and movies. Hmm. We've got psychologists, sociologists, and cultural anthropologists that are all lined up in that the whole thing is about two and the whole dyadic relationship thing is broken. So what we've got to have is we've got to have mediators and people who are uh, helping prop up that relationship. We've got a whole cottage industry that is huge, billions of dollars worth of cottage industry based on trying to uh, help patch up or put a Band-Aid on people's relationships when, in fact, that isn't what your relationship is. Your relationship has three elements, and the people who understand that have solid, stable relationships. Mm -hmm. And so then I began to look in the place that was the most extreme case that I could see, where, in fact, there are stable relationships. And that was in the marriages of fundamentalist Muslims, fundamentalist Christians, and fundamentalist Jews. Mm 
where the man is held to be very high and then the woman serves the man and all of that sort of thing. However, what they've got is they've got some relationship to God or Allah, and that's what stabilizes and empowers their relationship. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the most stable and empowered relationships we have. Meanwhile, we have all of these bright, well-educated people, but it's all about me and my partner. And when the thrill is gone, so is the marriage. I began to look at it. I asked two questions. The first question was, what's the minimum number of people in a relationship to have it be stable and effective? The answer 99 times out of 100 is two. The question is, where did you get that? The answer is nobody knows. Then we ask the question in a different way. Let's ask the question structurally, because that's where I did. I discovered everything about the young man uh, committing suicide as a structural deal. And I said, what's the minimum number of anchor points that an object needs to be stable? Mm -hmm. And everybody instantly got three. And I said, I want you to consider that your relationships are an object. Mm -hmm. And that in order to be stable, they need you, they need the other person. And, you know, I don't know if it's a new hot relationship, maybe it's sex, but that's gone. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's your relationship to God. Maybe it's what we, uh, you and I are in business together and what we want to do is buy and flip homes. Mm -hmm. We have a relationship as long as we're buying and flipping homes, we have an actually stable relationship. But as soon as we flip that home, we have no more relationship again. We have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. So when I began to look and think about it that way, I began to realize, oh, so structurally, what the relationships look like is either you're alone and the group is all over there, stage one, or two, it's like the first day you went to junior high and you're alone and everybody's around you and they seem to be connected and know each other, but you are separate from everyone. Or in the third case, it's the smart people who put together a little package around them uh, that is a hub and spoke form. But the hub and spoke form is all based on, I'm mm -hmm. great, you're not, and uh, you don't need to talk to those other people. Uh, you talk to me and I'll talk to them. It really is the basis of hierarchical command and control structures. And then I saw, you know, not everybody's doing that. And some people are producing to a remarkable level. You know, there are people who do hub and spoke, and of course they do a lot better than people who are separate. So hub and spoke, yeah, you could get something done, but there's... Inherent in that is bullying, inherent in that is domination, inherent in that is all the stuff about management, and it, and it gets organized around time, and it gets organized around efficiency. That's a zero-sum game. There are other group of people that in the same culture can form a non-zero-sum positive outcome game with a group of people where everybody realizes that they're all in the same boat together, and uh, they all need to be uh, grabbing a paddle and rowing. But if they do that effortlessly, they produce probably three to five times the output of the people at stage three, the hub and spoke. Mm -hmm. So I started measuring that and I found out, well, that's actually true. In fact, it's much better than uh, the ratio is much better than three to five times. But I can't say that because it sounds like a lie. So that's called stage four. And so the name of the game of what I do when I go into companies is to do a diagnostic on them. The diagnostic will actually show them that they're at stage two and stage three, uh, that they can work on efficiencies all they want, and all they're going to do is burn people out and have them leave and have great job turnover. Or we can actually shift the way that we relate to one another and do it in a way that it's non-zero and we're all partners, creating stable, effective partnerships all around. And those are all triangulated. So everybody's supported and stabilized in their relationships and then let people go to work and watch them produce a lot, lot, lot more. And not only that, but every once in a while, the world comes along with an opportunity to do something that's extraordinary and it's going to make history. The only people who actually can take advantage of that offer are the people who have done the stage four stabilizing of their partnerships and have worked at it so that they have a working relationship. Those people get invited to the dance. Those are the people who get to go to the Super Bowl. Those are the people who make it to the World Series. Those are the people who become highly successful. And 
what you've got is a whole world, better than 50% of the total population, that is doing hub and spoke, setting up their own little baronetcies and their own little fiefdoms and wondering why they never get, get invited to the big party. So I kind of worked all of that out, shared it with Dave. The book occurred out of that. It's the cultural map, which is the language deal. It is the structural map, which is actually the structures of everything. It's all about triads and going deep into triads because that's your key to making it happen. I had been doing strategy and, and not happy with the results. I found a guy at the U.S. Army War College that teaches uh, military strategy, and I got him to teach me his model. And then I spent about a year with my little beta group of 12-year-old girls figuring out how to make it people-friendly. And so there's something called the why strategy. So those are the four tools that are tribal leadership. I took your triad concept and applied it to my situation. We were really starting to make progress. But mm -hmm. here's what I learned, that the CEO was a stage two leader. <laughs> he wanted the dyadic relationship with because he could control everybody he could control that way. It. Yeah. And you when know, he got wind of it, he put a stop to it. Yep. Yep. That's exactly. So uh, one of the dangers to stage four, you know, that whole domination avoidance of domination thing that, uh, which is master slave and bully and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, thug and thuggy. <laughs> <laughs> thug and thuggy. So they are very, very sensitive to, wait a minute, this is going to upset my little apple cart. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and dismantle my little fiefdom, and I'm going to be exposed because I know nothing. I'm just acting here. It's a persona-driven thing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you get up to stage four and you get everybody working together. The big danger with that is the free rider. So the thing about it is we've got stages one, two, and three, which according to all of the B schools, the only thing that's really important is that you have trust is mm -hmm. totally not accurate. People say, I can't work with somebody that I don't trust. You work with people you don't trust all the time. Stuff like that, it has nothing to do with trust. And you can dismantle trust in no time flat uh, if you just look at and tell the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, if trust is an issue, there is no trust. End of story. But to go beyond that, once violated, never recovered, but people say things like, you know, they violated the truth. And then somebody goes, well, it'll take a long time. And you're going, take a long time is code. The word trust is a code word. And take a long time is a code. And what it means is not in this lifetime, but here's the deal. Stage four, where we're in the boat together and we're all working together, isn't based on trust at all. Mm -hmm. It's based on merit. Yeah. It's based on you bring it. We will work with you. And if you stop bringing it, you're out of the boat. Yep. I absolutely couldn't agree more. It's funny because yeah. I was interviewing somebody the other day and I mentioned the word collaboration. I, I don't remember the context. He reacted to that word in a negative way. He said, no, yeah. it's not collaboration. And I said, well, what does collaboration mean for you? And he said, collaboration means nobody takes accountability. Yeah, I have a guy on faculty with me for these various leadership academy. He's Lebanese. Mm -hmm. And so he's grown up and, and he's had a remarkable career. He was the head of station at Reuters in Lebanon for 19 years. And he became the head of the Middle East version of HBO. He was yeah. a CEO of that for a while. So, you know, he's a, he's a sophisticated man, but he and I are a direct argument with each other, which is part of the strength. Of this, uh, of this leadership academy. So when I first said, okay, first we want to distinguish management and leadership. Management is uh, granted by authority. Mm -hmm. So if there's somebody who has the authority and says to me, John, you're the manager, I can walk in and I can say, hi, Cinder, nice to meet you. I'm your new manager. Mm -hmm. You don't have a vote. That's the way management works. No voting. On the other hand, leadership is granted by permission of those being led. And if they don't grant you the permission, you don't get to be the leader. And the thing about it is you start taking people places and they get uncomfortable with it. They withdraw their permission for you to lead and they don't send you the note. So mm -hmm. leaders <laughs> constantly have to be working and checking into whether they have permission to go the next step, the next step, because in fact, by virtue of the function of leadership, I'm going to take you somewhere that's uncomfortable for you. 
So you have to actually grant that permission. Well, he gets unglued every time I say that. No, he's of the big man model of leader. Not, not where I'm coming from and certainly not a, a leadership model for the internet age. Hello. Yes. <laughs> that's a, that's the a, a model for the sheik. Sheik Altani of, of Qatar doesn't even run it that way. That's his point of view. And I got it. It's a valid point of view. It's just obsolete. Along with the tribal leadership model, you had some profiles of some companies tended to be stage three, some countries yeah. tend to be stage three. What is your perspective on that now that you've uh, been working in all of these different countries? I think that everybody has a default stage two, stage three relationship with everything around them. The default stage three is I'm great, you're not, and I have the stats to prove it. And the default stage two is my life sucks. Mm -hmm. So if you take a look at the relationship between the United States and Canada, United States uh, just, uh, you know, kind of takes on that they are stage three and Canada goes, uh, our life sucks in relationship to them, except in their own little silent little world, they're the stage three because they're superior to uh, these American boors. Mm -hmm. Israel, Palestine, stage mm -hmm. three, stage two. Russia, Syria, will just tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. United States, anybody. China, United States, United States, China. We have got years and years and years of, of rhetoric around, oh my God, their economy is going to be bigger than ours. That means that we will be stage two to their stage three. Mostly what I notice is wherever you are is stage three and their neighbor is stage two in their eye. Yes, I can see that. You know, nobody's, nobody's mad at the guy over there. They're mad at the person who's right next to him. <laughs> so are you still teaching these concepts in your leadership program? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. all I do. Pretty much the only thing that I'm interested in, but I'm really, really interested in it. And so I think about it. I talk about it. I write about it. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And are you seeing that the people who are going through the program then are embracing the, the notion that they can create a culture that's a stage four culture? Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's actually why I'm being sounded to go to Jordan to work with the bank. Uh -huh. And that was exactly why I was taken to Tashkent to train the startup entrepreneurs in Tashkent. And it was exactly why I was lecturing at New Vision University and American University in other areas. There's a story about Michael Jordan, the basketball player. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan won everything, did everything, got bored, went away, decided he wanted to play baseball. Mm -hmm. so, so he went away to play baseball. Well, what he discovered over the course of the next 15 months was that he could not hit a curveball. Mm -hmm. You know, he, was a, he could probably catch the ball and he could probably run. Uh, definitely, he was a great athlete, but he could not bring the bat. He couldn't hit a major league curveball because they started him out with the White Sox. He couldn't hit a triple A AAA league. He couldn't hit a D league. He couldn't hit a college curveball. At that point, he decided, I'm going to go back because I still want to do things. Uh, so I want to go back and play basketball again. So he goes back. And this was something that was called the second coming. The league is nervous. Michael's coming back because he's going to go right straight to the front of the line. It would be like if Tiger Woods had no injuries and he came back, he goes right to the front of the line. He comes back and Roy Firestone was interviewing him and he said, Michael, you've won the rings, you've got the awards, you've got all the acclamation, you're, you know, a slam dunk Hall of Fame, first round guy and everything. I was like, why in the world are you coming back? And Michael Jordan looked at him and he said, because I want to fill in the holes in my game. Mm. <laughs> Well, at that point, school was out because Michael Jordan had never, ever, ever uh, been known as anything other than lazy on defense. Mm. You know, he could he could put up so many points and he could create so much offense that it was somebody else's job to do the defense. He never paid any attention and he was he was uh, contemptuous of it. So they hired him a coach. Now. The coach they hired didn't know he was being hired to be Michael's coach because you can't talk to Michael directly. But they hired Dennis Rodman, who was the best defensive player in the NBA mm -hmm. from the dreaded enemy Detroit team. <laughs> and he came over. And all Michael did was watch how Dennis Rodman 
played the defensive game. He found out for him, this guy gets more rebounds than anybody because he watches when the guy shoots and he's watching how the ball is spinning. And because he knows if the ball is spinning a certain way, when it hits the rim, it's going to bounce off a certain way. So I can be positioned to be there. And so he was the rebounding champion because he did little things like that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of that year, Michael Jordan was defensive player of the year. He had filled in that hole in his game and that's what he did. That's what he did. So this is what this is about. When you get to Mm -hmm. stage four, you know, it's like your stage three guy who got upset when you said collaboration knows in his heart of heart, and he's a manager, he knows for a fact that that's a hole in his game, but he doesn't want it exposed. So to bring it back, what I notice is that Southeast Asia, not so much, definitely in Central Asia, definitely in the Middle East, but more Central Asia than any. People are eager for this information because it's filling in the hole in their game. Mm -hmm. I work with a demographic that is age 27 to 42. So they're ready to prepare themselves for their next step. And their next step is going to be stepping into leadership. No kidding. They're going into the parliament. They're going to get elected president of their country. They're going to become uh, a big executive in the business or they're running an NGO. And they're interested in getting the holes in their games fixed so that when they step in, they are competent as a leader. Mm-hmm. So they're listening for that. Yeah, I so agree. And the 27 to 42 year old, the, the world traveler, the person you want, who is eager to learn and develop, that's yeah. exactly the people who listen to this program. Exactly. I don't flatter myself that I have anything of interest to say to a 55 year old. They've got it, and they've got it wired, and it's fine. And they're mm-hmm. just going to kind of cruise out for the Mm -hmm. most part. Look good a few times, pop a few deals, stuff like that, but basically just kind of keep their position secure. But those people that are struggling, that are fighting, that are wanting to get into the C-suite, those are the people that that I have something of value to say to. Yes. It's, It's so interesting also to hear how the cultures of some of these countries that really respected elder and don't yes. lose face, that they're really struggling with this, how to do business in this new economy yes. and also maintain the best of our culture. Yes, that is exactly so. Uh, in January, I'm going to go to uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. Ho Chi Minh City is so sensational, mm. so alive and hopping. I think the average age is 28 and everybody is uh, an entrepreneur or a startup of some kind. Mm. And they are eager, 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 eager to get into and make an impact on the world market, not just the Asian market. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's gorgeous. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I love the energy and passion you have for your work. You know, as I told you in 2009 or 10, reading tribal leadership and adapting it to the organizational culture I was working in really helped me understand the people dynamics that were getting in the way of individuals, teams, and the organization itself from reaching its full potential. I would now like to segue to a few closing questions to capture your lessons learned. Knowing what you know now, what's the most important advice you would give someone? If I could say it in terms of uh, something that I do every day that I highly recommend as a practice, this is what comes up for me. I do what I call my daily five W's. And the W's are who, who, what, who, what. Okay. The the first who has three parts. So the first, uh, this is what I do when I get into the shower every day. I turn on the shower, I put soap in my hair, and then I ask this question, who am I? Hmm. Now, I never get a very good answer with that. About the best as that I could get out of that is I'm kind of a nice guy. (laughs) That's about as good as it gets. The second part of the question is, who am I becoming? And so I can actually access that. I can look at that and I can go, who do I admire? You know, and I could actually even put a face on it. I might say, I'm becoming Richard Branson or I'm becoming Werner Earhart or I'm becoming someone I admire, Mm -hmm. you know. Desmond Tutu or someone like that. Who am I becoming? The third question is, who am I being today? That one kind of nails me. Then the second question is another who question. Who are my partners? Mm -hmm. 
And I'm find that people do not think in terms of partnership, they think in terms of domination. Mm -hmm. So who are my partners? Who am I a peer with? Who can I work with? Like my experience, and it has been my experience every time I've talked to you, is one of partnership. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, rather than, you know, you trying to run me or me trying to run you, we just don't do that. But most people do. The third question is, what are we building? That's me and my partners. What are we building together? What are we building? Is, and that's a big question. I just finished with a guy who's running for governor of the state of New Hampshire. And I gave him these five questions. And that was right there where we got started. He's like, what are you building, dude? And then the fourth question is, who do we touch? And then the fifth question is, what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. And these are my background questions all day, every day. And I would recommend that people take on that, that question set. I love that. Knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? I would cut bait and move on quicker. I, you know, I have this thing, and it must be around a notion that I have around loyalty. Loyalty is a big word with me. Mm -hmm. And so I will kind of hang on in my belief that the condition will improve or the person will grow up or whatever for years when if I really looked at it and had really been paying attention and been awake, I would have seen uh, the flags all along. Mm -hmm. But I waited until it became an impossible situation. Uh, then I suffered for a while longer and then I finally left. And when I leave, what I do is I give everything to them uh, and then I go and start over. What's another way to look at that when you see that, oh, this is not going well? How do you shift your mindset so that you can break away sooner? Well, I, haven't, I, I cannot say that I have any expertise in this at all. I don't have mastery in the get out of town part of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of moving on in life. But one is that I have to actually sort of distinguish between the human part, the part where I'm in love with that person, and I, and I do, I fall in love with people, and the practical application of, is this forwarding our partnership? Mm -hmm. And if I tell the truth about the partnership, what I discover is something that I don't want to see, which is that the other person is probably not in it as deeply. People grow, they change, they evolve, and they, and they come up with, uh, they have different goals. Mm -hmm. And they have different paths that they're heading down. No harm, no foul. Where we're missing is, uh, do you actually, honestly, no kidding, have resonant core values? And what I mm -hmm. noticed is, maybe not. Maybe I just fell in love. That's a good way to look at it. Well, here's one thing that I say, uh, Cinder, when I walk in after I've said, hello, my name is John, and welcome. I say, I'm not here for you. I am not here for you. Usually that's shocking to people because they're leaders, you mm -hmm. know, and they've been propped up. Mm -hmm. But I say, I am not here for you. And I want you to get that in your bones. I am not here for you. Here's who I'm here for. I'm here for your parents and your grandparents. And I'm here on behalf of your children and your grandchildren. And mm -hmm. you're the people I'm talking to. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. I haven't heard that before. Well, the reason is, is because... The arc of management is 90 days. The arc of leadership is about 150 years. Because leaders lead from whatever they inherited from their parents and grandparents and all of the culture around them. And whatever are the qualities or characteristics or virtues or values that they're going to leave to their children and their grandchildren. John, thank you so much for sharing your work of tribal leadership. I would love to stay on the phone with you more and hear more about what you're doing. I'm just thrilled that we had this opportunity to catch up. Oh, Cinder, thank you so also much. Also share your work around uh, tribal leadership and developing leaders. And I learned so much about you that I, you know, that I didn't know before. <laughs> but you did uh, <laughs> pull up some stuff that I haven't spoken about in a while and everything. It was kind of interesting to revisit that. Okay, my dear, you take care. All righty, you too. I'm bye -bye. Cinder Niemela, and you've been listening to the Inspired Wisdom Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We hope these conversations illuminate your path to your highest potential. 
For show notes and links to resources mentioned during today's episode, please go to inspiredwisdom.us. You can also follow Inspired Wisdom on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, design a fulfilling and prosperous life that engages your talents and passions.